Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're joined this afternoon by London City Councillor Josh Morgan and the Medical Officer of Health for the Middlesex London Health Unit, Dr. Chris Mackey. We'd like to welcome the media who are in attendance for this afternoon's briefing and invite them to submit their questions using the question forum here on Microsoft Teams. Just a reminder for those asking questions today to please indicate your name and media outlet. We would also like to welcome those tuning in on Rogers Television, Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel, as well as those listeners for Global News Radio and those watching on the CTV London website. We'll get to the opening statements right away and we'll start with Councillor Josh Morgan. Councillor Morgan. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, for those wondering why uh, why I am participating uh, in the briefing today instead of the mayor, the mayor is on a very important call with 19 other mayors of cities that have casinos uh, to discuss uh, reopening plans for casinos across that industry. And so um, I'm happy to be here today to provide a little bit of information, but uh, but that's uh, that's why I'm here and the mayor uh, isn't. Um, the uh, I guess the, the thing that I would comment on is is uh, people are probably wondering how the long weekend went. So uh, over the course of the long weekend, uh, bylaw officers were obviously out and I'm very happy to report that there were no pandemic related bylaw infractions uh, over that long weekend. So uh, I think that means that the, the city and the health units education campaign is working really well. Um, people are aware of what they are supposed to be doing and, uh, and people are doing it. Um, since the implementation of the mask bylaw, uh, city bylaw enforcement staff have visited almost 800 biz businesses speaking to owners and employees uh, and the public. Um, of those 800 business visits, only 37 members of the public were not wearing masks and those uh, individuals were provided with education about the bylaw. So again, uh, another example of the education campaigns uh, working, um, people are doing the right thing and uh, where there are instances, uh, our bylaw officers are providing uh, some information and education uh, to uh, to the individuals and the businesses. So um, those are the updates that, that I have uh, over the course of the weekend and uh, happy to hear what Dr. Mackey has to say as well. Thank you very much, Councillor Morgan. Uh, so jumping right into our local numbers, we had uh, one, one, three, and zero cases over the past four days. So back to those, you know, one to two cases on average that we had for uh, for a couple of weeks in early July, uh, which is quite reassuring locally. Uh, lots, vast majority of our cases have been linked to either a previous case or a specific example of travel. Uh, travel is now accounting for somewhere between a third and a half of our cases, uh, depending on the week. So as much as uh, you know, we are seeing travel continue to reopen, uh, it's really important that people continue to take precautions when traveling, uh, respect quarantine when they return, and of course get tested whenever they may have symptoms after traveling. Uh, provincially, the numbers have been around 100 over the last uh, few days, less than 100 for two days now. Uh, so that's very encouraging provincially as well. And really, you know, as much we, as we have seen the numbers fluctuating over the last few weeks, uh, the fact that we are in stage three, there is a lot more opening and still the cases are relatively low is actually quite reassuring. Uh, the other thing to mention over the weekend, no deaths at all. Uh, so again, we're approaching uh, almost two months now, uh, over seven weeks with no deaths in London or Middlesex, uh, which is very encouraging. Uh, echoing the experience of the city, uh, we've not had a lot of complaints about uh, businesses that aren't respecting the mask bylaw. Uh, so that's encouraging as well. I'll pause there, Beth, happy to take any questions. Great, thanks very much, Dr. Mackey and Councillor Morgan for those opening statements. We do have a few questions in queue here, so we'll get to those right away. The first question for us here comes from Steve Young with CTV London and News Talk CJBK. Dr. Mackey, this question is for you. Can retail stores make up their own mask policies that do not match the health unit guidelines? For example, can a children's store policy mandate all people wear masks, including children under 12? Yes, so certainly businesses can create uh, rules that are more strict, not 
uh, rules that are less strict than the bylaw and the public health instruction, which essentially say the same thing, uh, have dictated. The, the only catch is that, of course, uh, you know, rules in any facility cannot violate uh, human rights. So if somebody, for example, has a, a human rights issue that's protected under uh, the Canadian Charter or the Ontario Human Rights Code, uh, a business would not be able to discriminate uh, or deny service based on that issue. A good example would be if somebody has a medical condition or a disability that affects their ability to wear a mask, a, a, a facility would not be able to deny them service uh, based on not wearing a mask related to that uh, medical or dis disability issue. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. Our next question here does come from Carrie McKee with CBC London. This question is for you, Dr. Mackey. What, if any, observations have you made in our community that you are concerned about? For example, miswearing or misuse of masks. Yeah, in, in general, since the uh, mandated masks came into force, we've had pretty good compliance. Uh, one thing that uh, that I do see in public fairly often that uh, is a concern from an infection control perspective is people wearing the mask over their chins. Uh, that's just there, there are just so many ways when you move a mask around in that way. Uh, to potentially contaminate uh, the mask and or yourself. And so when wearing the mask, it needs to be placed uh, over the mouth and nose and chin uh, and then removed from the from, you know, the back of the mask forward uh, when it's over the when it's just kind of people walking down the street in particular, they might be temporarily removing their mask between stores. Uh, that's just you're just bound to contaminate that way. Uh, so if you're taking the mask off, please take it off fully. Um, and ideally, you know, if it's a reusable mask, uh, wash it before placing it again. Definitely washing hands. Uh, people that are going to be placing and removing masks frequently should certainly carry their own hand sanitizer as well as uh, using whatever, whatever is available in the facilities they're going into and coming out of, uh, because that'll be uh, really important. Again, a part of the value of the mask is that it captures droplets on both sides. And if we then just go and touch the mask uh, and potentially touching other things and other people uh, and ourselves, then we uh, remove some of the protections of, uh, of the, the mandatory masking. The other thing that uh, is helpful to remember is that you know the city bylaw focused on masking, which I think was really important. The public health instruction to businesses, which we ordered, uh, from the Middlesex London Health Unit uh, included also having san hand sanitizers at entrances, exits, and anywhere where uh, payments are taken, such as a, a checkout uh, counter, because those are the places where people are most likely to touch objects uh, coming and going or pin pads or, or paying with cash. And so when you are in those places, you should be able to quickly look around and find a hand sanitizer available to you. Uh, if you're not, please do flag that to uh, the store management because that's part of the requirements under the public health instruction. Great, thanks very much for that response, Dr. Mackey. Our next question comes to us from Grant Demi with Maya Pem Strathroy. This question is for you, Dr. Mackey, and it is a three-part question. Dr. Mackey, from the outside looking in, do you agree with the decision to keep Windsor Essex in stage two? Why do you think they are having difficulties keeping cases down and are you more concerned now than stated previously about their residents traveling to Middlesex, London? So there are two main factors that are keeping this pandemic wave alive in, in Windsor and Essex. First of all, uh, the proximity to Detroit. Uh, the uh, Detroit area has been hit uh, very hard by the pandemic, very high rates of illness. And we know that the, even, even at the height of restrictions, there were hundreds of people crossing the border every day to work in the healthcare system uh, as essential workers. So we know there's been a lot of introductions over and over of illness uh, across the Detroit-Windsor border. And the other factor is the large um, farms. And, you know, people have pointed at temporary foreign workers. It's really not an issue of temporary foreign workers. Uh, it's an issue of housing conditions on those farms. You know, in some of those cases, you have hundreds 
uh, of people who are living in in bunk houses with shared washrooms and and uh, kitchen facilities. And so if you have one case that can travel very quickly through that sort of facility and any you know any isolation uh, is very difficult to undertake when you're sharing a washroom uh, a bedroom and a bathroom. Uh, so you've seen significant outbreaks on those farms and of course um, those uh, outbreaks uh, spread into the general community as well because you have lots of farms where there's a mixture of people that live on the farm and farmhands that travel from farm to farm that might have some expertise or just you know the way they work is to travel to multiple farms in one season. Uh, so, so that really does spread pretty easily in those environments. Um, those those would be the main reasons, and, and the the rates of illness in Windsor and Essex are uh, many times higher, five to ten times higher than what you're seeing in London and Middlesex. Uh, of course, there's some concern about uh, people traveling. The main concern would be around those that are in those high risk environments, uh, such as the farms that have had outbreaks. But um, Windsor Essex Health Unit and partners have been uh, doing a great job of containing those, uh, making sure that there are isolation facilities available uh, so that you know people that are working on a farm uh, can get into a hotel room and, and self isolate from the others uh, on the farm so that they're not spreading the illness. Uh, so I'm seeing real progress there and it just it will take time to wrestle down those uh, regular introductions that are continuing of uh, the disease from across the border. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey. Our next question here comes to us from Megan Stacy with the London Free Press. Dr. Mackey, this is a follow-up question from your opening statements where you referenced travel. Um, the follow-up from Megan for you is, does this include domestic or international travel or within the province? Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Megan. So the, the concern is really international travel. Uh, in Ontario, uh, again, Windsor is an exception, uh, but even the vast majority of people who are traveling from Windsor to London uh, would be at relatively low risk. Uh, the, the travel cases that we're seeing are the ones that are associated with travel to the US, uh, travel to certain places uh, internationally, you know, uh, for example, we had some cases uh, in the last couple of weeks where people have traveled in Eastern Europe. Um, there are still some places where uh, the, uh, the pandemic is raging fairly hard. Uh, Israel has had a significant second wave. So uh, as we, as you know, the, if you look back maybe two months ago to the peak of our local wave, two or three months ago, um, April, our April peaks, almost all of the cases at that point were domestically acquired. People weren't traveling at all and uh, were acquiring the cases uh, from, you know, close contacts here in London and Middlesex. Um, that is still occurring, but it, it's, it's uh, travel is becoming uh, more a factor just as it was at the beginning of the pandemic when we did not have a lot of uh, local activity. So, you know, the fact that there's really no jurisdiction at this point that's really been able to put a lid on their 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 pandemic. Um, it just means that travel will continue to be a, a concern uh, over the coming weeks and months. Uh, the other thing that makes us vulnerable is that so few people in Ontario have actually been infected and that came out of a Public Health Ontario study that was reported uh, last week where only uh, their estimate based on blood samples was that only 1.1% of people had antibodies for the COVID infection. Now, we know that only about half of people develop antibodies at all. Uh, so it may be that our infection rate is more like two or 3%, uh, but that's not nearly enough to develop the sort of herd immunity that would put a, a natural limit on the spread of the outbreak. So in places like again the US where you're seeing a lot higher attack rates and ongoing high levels of pandemic activity, that just means that um, people traveling there are at much higher risk than they would be here. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mackey, for that response. That's um, all the questions we have here today. So thank you 
Councillor Morgan for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate you being on here with us and able to join this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. And we'll be back here again tomorrow at two o'clock when we are joined by the Warden of Middlesex County, Kathy Burkhart-Jessen. So thanks to everyone for tuning in this afternoon and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a great afternoon.